Hey, welcome to Bridgepoint's Church Online. If you're brand new with us, my name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor here. And we would love for you just to give us a little wave in the comments section, just so that I can go back and see you a little bit later, know that you were with us. We are so glad you were here today. Uh, whenever and wherever you are joining us, it is really good to be together. I'm thankful for all of the technology that it has allowed us to stay connected through this time. Um, but we've got great news. This last week, we shared our plan for reopening. And so in just a few weeks, on June 28th, we will be back together again. And so we are so excited about that. We want you to stay tuned and stay connected um, so that through this, in anticipation of that, you can know what to expect. We still have a lot of information to get out to you about how we're, we're going to be preparing for that and um, trying, doing our best to ensure a safe and healthy environment for all who come. So whether you come and join us that very first day or you need to stay connected online a little longer, we want to make sure you know that we've got a place for you. And so we hope you circle that on the calendar. We are excited to be together. As we get started, I'd really love to take a moment to pray with you. Let's go to the Father. Uh, Father God, um, we love you. And we thank you for the way that you are steady and true, the way that you have held us close through all of this. God, I pray for our people, that whatever they're facing, whatever they're feeling, they would, they would stay connected to your church. They'd stay close to Jesus. Father, this has been a heavy week. My heart is deeply burdened. God, I pray specifically for our brothers and sisters of color that, that your arms would be felt around them this week as so much tension and turmoil and tragedy uh, characterize our nation. God, I pray that you would help us all to respond with wisdom, with grace and support. Father, it feels like we need you maybe more than ever to be our rock and our refuge. God, I pray that you would heal us. You would heal our broken hearts. You would heal our broken land. God, all of this just makes me long even more for the return of Jesus, the day when those who are faithful to him will be welcomed into the perfect paradise of heaven where no racism, no hatred, no injustice, no violence, no sin and grief and sorrow will plague your people any longer. Lord Jesus, come quickly. But until that day, God, we want to be faithful. And so I pray that this time today would help us to be faithful to you. That as we fix our eyes on Jesus, that you would inspire us in the ways we need to cling to you, no matter what we face, no matter what it costs. In Jesus' name. Amen. What was the most important moment in your life that you were not ready for? Do you remember it? Maybe it was a job interview that happened a little earlier in the day than you expected, a test that, that snuck up on you. Uh, maybe, maybe it was a moment, a date, a wedding day. Uh, for me, the story that comes to mind is the day that our first child, my daughter Caroline, was born. It was about 11 years ago. And uh, it, it was a little less than a week before Rachel was due. She goes into the office, uh, goes into her workplace uh, early in the morning that day. And by mid-morning, I get a call from her that she's feeling a little funny. And so we meet at her doctor's office and they run a few tests and tell us that she is headed to labor. And so we get her to the hospital and I thought it would be a good idea to run home really quickly to get our bag, uh, to take care of a couple things because it's kind of snuck up on us a little bit. And so while I'm at home, I, I'd been growing out some facial hair in anticipation. I don't know, guys do weird things, right? But I thought, man, the first time I hold my little girl, I want my face to be smooth so she can. So I started to shave, and I'm, sh I'm shaving. I'm like, well, I might as well jump in the shower real quick. And then I'm like, well, I, I don't know how long we'll be at the hospital, so I should probably like make a sandwich and throw, throw a few extra snacks in the bag. And, and as I'm doing this, I'm starting to get texts from Rachel, like, where are you? When are you coming? And so I text her back. I'm on my way, and I get there. And in the time that had passed, like she had progressed. Apparently, my wife goes through labor real quick. Uh, she, she, she was breathing heavy, making funny noises, like it was coming. And I had nearly missed the birth of my first child because it was a moment I was not ready for. I don't know what your story is. But here's the thing. This series called Letters from Jesus, it's all about getting us ready for the most important moment of our lives. Whether you know it or not, a day is coming when Jesus will return. 
That is a truth that is, that is reverberated throughout the New Testament. Jesus says it himself, I'm coming back. And we believe that on that day, we don't know when it's going to happen, this side of death or the other, but when Jesus returns, everyone is going to stand before his glorious throne. And in that moment, when you stand before him, you and I will be judged based on how we loved him and lived for him during our time here on earth. That is a moment that we do not want to be unprepared for, right? It is a moment we want to be ready for. It's a moment Jesus wants you to be ready for. He's not trying to sneak up on you. He's not trying to surprise you. We just don't know when it's going to happen. And whenever it happens, we want to be ready so that when he comes and we stand before him, we are found faithful and pleasing in his sight based on how we love him and live for him right here on earth. And so because Jesus wants us to be ready for it, he doesn't make us guess how to be ready. In fact, he gives us exactly what we need. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus dictated a series of letters to his servant, a man named John, to write down and then send to these churches. And the whole point of these letters that we've been studying for the last few weeks is that these churches who each had a unique situation and a unique circumstance or a threat to their faithfulness in Jesus, would hear from him exactly what they needed. And so to some, Jesus spoke to comfort. To others, Jesus spoke to confront. A lot of times there's a mix of both. But in each case, Jesus gave each church exactly what they needed. And many years later, these letters are just as relevant to us today. Because we still face the exact same challenges, the exact same threats to our faithfulness. We still need to hear the same words from Jesus. In fact, that was his intention all, all along. Because every letter in the book of Revelation ends with this. Jesus says, whoever has ears, let them hear. What the Spirit says to the churches, the point is, if you can hear this, if you can receive it, these words are for you. And so many years later, we've been opening these letters up one or two at a time, to hear what Jesus has to say to us, to help us be ready for that moment when he returns and we stand before him. And so last week, Jacob preached, did a great job, and Jacob preached about this church that was in a city where it was very easy to be a Christian. It may sound great, but that can actually become a threat to us as well. Conversely, this week, we're going to look at the letters Jesus sent to two churches who were in places where it was very, very costly very, very difficult to be a Christian. So I want, to, I want you to see the text. We're going to look at two letters. Um, the first one will be found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. That's the letter Jesus sent to a church in the city of Smyrna. And the second will be in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. This is a letter Jesus sent to the church in the city of Philadelphia. Not the one you're thinking. These two churches... Uh, are in, uh, would have been in modern-day Turkey in the, in the ancient world. It was called Asia Minor. It was the far eastern reach of the Roman Empire. And so these two churches shared something in common, something unfortunate in common. Where they lived, it was very costly to be a Christian. So what we want to do today is look at these letters and draw out truths that will help us understand how to live, how to remain faithful, even when faith costs us a great deal. I don't know if you've experienced this yet. Maybe you're brand new to all of this and you're just trying to investigate Jesus and decide if it's for you. Maybe uh, you're, you're hoping that it makes everything go right. I would love to be able to stand here and tell you that following Jesus is just rainbows and unicorns all the time. It is just good and beautiful. It is hard though. Following Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is difficult. But it makes sense because for, for someone who has given so much to us, for someone who has done so much for us, it would only make sense that sometimes our faith, our love, our gratitude to him costs us something. So maybe you're brand new in faith and you're starting to realize that there are some difficult decisions that come with following Jesus. Relationships change. Sometimes you face opposition. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time. You look back over those many years and you can see the times and the places that your devotion to Jesus costs you greatly. Maybe you're in a time like that right now. So these words that Jesus speaks, first to the, those, those ancient churches and now to us today, are incredibly important so that we can learn how to be faithful even when it's costly. So we're going to look at the first letter 
that's found in chapter 2, verse 8. Jesus sends it to this church in the city of Smyrna. Here's what you need to know about Smyrna. It was known for its allegiance to the Roman Empire. This city, even though it was a long way from the capital city of Rome, it was known for its loyalty and its allegiance to the emperor of Rome. And it, this city had demonstrated that loyalty many times over its history. And so as a result, it had been given privileges. And one of those privileges was that it was home to the very first temple that was dedicated to the worship of the emperor. Now that sounds strange to us in our modern context, but in the ancient world, emperors, and especially the emperor of Rome, expected the people, his citizens, to worship him to devote themselves to him, to express undying, unlimited loyalty to him. And so they they built a temple. And late in the first century, about the same time that the book of Revelation was written, there, there was an emperor in power named Domitian, and he had made it compulsory, mandatory, that every citizen in his empire would once a year express their loyalty to him. This is how they would do it. Each citizen had to go to their local temple and there would be an altar where where a fire was burning and they would take a pinch of incense and they would would drop it over the fire. And as, as the incense fell on the fire, smoke and an aroma would rise up. And as that rose up, they would have to say the words, Caesar is Lord. It was an act of devotion an act of loyalty, an ultimate act of surrender. It's what we call worship. And upon this action, they would leave the temple and receive a certificate verifying that they had declared that year their loyalty to Caesar, and that essentially gave them privileges as a citizen. Now, you can imagine what kind of conflict this created for Christians who were told to worship God alone and to declare that Jesus is Lord. And so they refused to do this. And by refusing to do this, especially in the city of Smyrna, they suffered greatly. And Jesus knows these Christians are hanging on by a thread. Some of them have been beaten. Others have been thrown in prison. All of them are suffering to some degree or another because of Jesus. He loves this church. He loves you, church. And so he sends these letters to these hurting Christians. In verse 80 says this, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these words, these are the words of him who is first and last, who died and came back to life again. I know your afflictions, I know your poverty, yet you are rich I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. See, the Jews wanted to point their fingers at the disloyalty of the Christians to make them look worse and to make the Jews look better. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. That's a symbolic period of time. He says, but be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Jesus says this, he does not promise that that they won't experience pain. He does not promise a near end to the struggles that they are going through. What he says is this, he says, cling to me, hold on to me and it will be worth it. Don't give up. Don't fear. Be faithful. Stay close. Keep holding on. And it will be worth it. Maybe you have gone through some experiences where it feels like faith has cost you something and you need to hear similar words, not promises that it's all going to be better or it'll be easier from here on out. You just need to hear this reminder, this gentle word from Jesus. Hold on. Stay close. It's going to be worth it. See, the church in Philadelphia was facing a similar situation. So if you flip over to Revelation chapter 3, you'll see the letter Jesus sent to them. You see, it wasn't quite the same situation. Philadelphia was best known for for being located on a fault line, which is not an awesome claim to fame. Early in the first century, around 17 AD, the whole city had been destroyed. And even after it had been rebuilt with the help of the emperor, citizens didn't want to live in the city. 
Too many people had died. Too many things had been destroyed. And so they lived in temporary dwellings outside the city. And any time they would come into the city of Philadelphia for, for business or for worship or for any other thing, uh, they, they, would, they would carefully pay attention to their surroundings. And if ever there was a tremor, as there often were, they would immediately, the whole city would evacuate just at the first sign of anything shaking because they lived in fear even 75 years after that terrible earthquake. And in the midst of all that, they felt weak, they felt weary, they were worried. And added to that, there was this escalating tension between the Christians and the Jews in that city. The Jews had great animosity They accused the Christians of things like hypocrisy. They accused the Christians of being disloyal to the emperor. Sometimes they even mistreated them, boycotted their businesses. Life was hard for Christians in this city too. And to these weak Christians, these weary Christians, Jesus writes in verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these words. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. He looks at this church and he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. He's saying, my kingdom is open to you. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. He says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. They have not allowed their suffering and their struggles to become an excuse for disobedience or unfaithfulness. He says, I will make those who are a synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I've loved you. Maybe that was part of the accusation from the Jews toward the Christians is that God didn't really love them. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. His crown was, was symbolic of their salvation. He says, don't just cling to it so no one can take it. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in my temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, I know you are weak. I know you are weary. Just keep holding on to me and it will be worth it. Church, I think maybe the simple truth from these two letters that Jesus is urging us to understand is this. That Jesus wants you to cling to him even when it's costly. I'd love for you to write that down. In fact, just say it out loud. Jesus wants you to cling to him even when it's costly. I don't know exactly how you have felt the cost of faith, but my guess is you have in some way or another. If you're following Jesus, you eventually will. And from these letters, we can pull out maybe a few ways that we sometimes feel the cost of faith. Maybe one of the ways that we feel the cost of faith is that Um, you you become the object of malicious words. I mean, that that was the case for Christians in both cities. They they were the object of accusations, object of uh, of malicious, hateful, hurtful, harmful words. Maybe you have experienced that at some point. Maybe people close to you, friends or family members, have spoken words that just cut to your heart simply because you believe in Jesus. Maybe it's been suggested that you are intellectually naive, because you believe in Jesus and the resurrection. Maybe it's been suggested that you are a hypocrite, that you are inconsistent, that you are arrogant because of your actions or your belief. Maybe someone has spread rumors about you just wanting to tarnish your reputation that you have worked so hard to build up simply because you love and follow Jesus. This is one of the ways that we start to feel the cost of our faith in him. Sometimes that changes relationships, creates tension, bitterness, resentment. 
Maybe another way that you have felt the high cost of faith is, is through missed opportunities. There, there's something unique in, in this letter to Smyrna. See, Smyrna was this wealthy city, and yet the Christians were poor. Jesus says that he knows about their poverty. It begs the question, well, like, well, why are they so poor when they're living in a wealthy city? And the answer is likely that as a result of their faith, The small business owners have been boycotted. As a result of their faith, the goods that they need have had inflated prices only for them. It's likely that they have missed opportunities. They they have missed opportunities to grow their businesses or to acquire wealth because they've been unwilling to compromise and do unethical things like the world around them. One way or another, they are poor and the world around them is rich. Maybe for you, there are all kinds of missed opportunities that you could identify because of your faith in Jesus. Maybe it's just like them, something to do with business, your, your profession, your career. You've been unwilling to compromise. You've been committed to telling the truth, prioritizing your family, protecting your purity, choosing not to marginalize or mistreat others. And as a result, others have passed you by in their pursuit of wealth or success. And you feel like opportunities have been afforded to others that have been denied to you, maybe because of your faith in Jesus or how you live for him. Maybe the missed opportunities are more relational. Like you have chosen a life of singleness rather than a life of compromise or settling for something less than what you know is God's best for you. Maybe for you, the missed opportunities are in your friendships because you stop getting invited to things because people know what you choose not to do. You don't laugh at their jokes. You don't do the things they do. You don't cross the lines they cross. And so you've stopped getting those calls. Maybe for you, it's missed opportunities in many other ways. The idea is that you, you look at your life, you're like, I, I don't feel like I have what other people have, and it's because of Jesus. Maybe the missed opportunities for you are, are that you look back and you know that your time and your money belong to God, and so you give them to him generously. And as a result, because of what you have chosen to give to God in an act of worship to him, you have less to call your own. And so you choose not to buy the same cars that some of your peers drive. You choose to to not upgrade your house in the same way. You don't go on the same vacations or have the same hobbies because you choose to use your money or your time in different ways. It has cost you, it, it has led to some missed opportunities. And you look at that and you think, my faith in Jesus, it's cost me a lot. The third way that we see in these letters that faith has been so costly for the first century Christians is they were the objects, the targets of actual mistreatment. They were thrown in prison. Many of them were beaten. Some of them were tortured. A few of them were even killed just because they believed in Jesus. And this is where their story and ours diverges at least a little bit. I mean, there are places in our world today where that still happens. We just don't feel it quite as much. But maybe there are ways that you have felt the injustice of the world in a different way because of your faith. Maybe it's in how you choose to react when you are the object of injustice. Maybe it's because you choose to try to model the love of Jesus, peace and mercy and forgiveness. And as a result, it feels like the mistreatment just continues to heap onto you. But one way or another, hey, if it's one of these or maybe something else, we all in some ways feel the cost of faith. And the question is, when, when our faith in Jesus costs us something deep, costs us something dear, how will we respond in those moments? Those are defining moments in our faith. And we really have two choices. One choice is to say it is just too hard. It's just not worth it. And we let go. The other option is to say, I've got to hold on. I've got to believe. I've got to cling to Jesus. And what we know is that Jesus wants us to cling to him even when it's costly. And so I want to make two statements during our remaining time, two statements that we see from these two letters that give us reason to cling to Jesus, okay? And the first is this. When faith is costly, we cling to Jesus because we know who he is. Write that down. When faith is costly, we cling to Jesus because we know who he is. Reminds me of an experience um, several years ago. I went with a few buddies to a, a Christian camp in New Mexico for a week. 
And while we were there, we were, we were just enjoying the camp and all of the recreational opportunities that it provided. And one of our friends who worked at the camp had mentioned that the camp offered opportunities to repel off of cliffs, like many feet down. I'm pretty scared of heights, but I thought this is a unique opportunity, so I want to do it. So we went up to the top of this cliff, you know, uh, somehow I got talked into being the first one over, and so I put on the harness, I strap in, and I'm looking at my friends, and they're, they're urging me on, and I start to slowly inch toward the ledge. You know, behind me, there's a 60-foot drop, and this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I'm getting the instructions to just kind of like hop off the wall all the way down, and so I'm trying to talk myself into it, so I'm backing up, and I'm holding on, and I, I get to that point where I'm holding on to the rope, and I'm leaning back, and it's the point of no return, and it was only at that moment that for the first time I looked over my shoulder. Big mistake. Not because of the drop that was beneath me, but because it was at that point that I first saw the person who was holding on to me on the other end of the rope. It was a camp counselor. It looked like a teenage girl who could not weigh more than 110 pounds. And I want you to understand, I am all for equal opportunity, but gravity works, right? And so the only thing I could imagine happening when I jumped off the ledge, is that I would plummet down and she would skyrocket up. I didn't see any other way that this could work. And so as I am holding on and starting to tremble in this harness, we got to have a crucial conversation real quick, right? And so I get to know this girl and she says that she has done this before. My buddies up, uh, up top verify that. She assures me that she knows how to do this. And then maybe the most important bit of information she shared is that she showed me how she was strapped into the ground. And at that point, I thought, okay, now that I know a little bit better the person on the other end of the rope, I can keep going. You know where I'm going with this? That when you know a little bit better the person on the other end of the rope, you can keep holding on. You can keep going. And so that is exactly what Jesus aims for in this moment as he is riding to these churches. He wants them to understand who he is. And so to the church in Sardis, or excuse me, Smyrna, to the church in Smyrna, he writes these words. Listen to how he reminds them of who he is. He says, these are the words, this is verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. He goes, this is what you need to know about me. He goes, I am the first, meaning like I was there in the beginning and not just the beginning of, of humanity or the beginning of the world, but the beginning, beginning, like way back in that eternal expanse of time before I was there. Not only was I there, I was God. And he says, also, in addition to that, I'm the last, which means that after everything in this world has come and gone, after it's all been done away with, in the very end, when nothing else stands, I will still be God. And I will still be there. And his point is this. If I am God in the beginning and I am God at the end, that means that I am God at every moment in between. And so whatever you are facing, whatever you are going through, I am God. And you need to know that. He also says that I am the one, don't forget this, that died and became alive again. His point is this. He goes, I know what you are facing. I know what you are fearing. The thing that you fear most is losing your life. The thing you fear most is death, which by the way is reasonable. But he says the very thing that you fear most is the thing that I walked through and came out alive. And so no matter what you're going, to, going through, if you cling to me, you will come out alive. He said, if you cling to me, Jesus is saying this, I've walked through death and came out alive. If you cling to me, no matter what you go through, no matter what your faith in me costs, you will come out alive on the other side. To the church in Philadelphia, he says this. In verse 7, he says, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. He goes, I need you to understand this. I am holy, I am God, I am true, I am faithful. You can trust me, and when I open my kingdom to you, no one can close that door. Jesus' point in all of this is that if you know who he is, if you know who's on the other end of your rope, if you know who's on the other side of your journey, then you will keep clinging to him even when it's costly. When it hurts, when it's hard, 
when there are hateful people on the other side of it, like you can keep clinging to Jesus because of who you know him to be. So my question for you is, do you know who Jesus is? Do you need to be reminded that he is God in the beginning? He's God in the end. He's God in every moment in between. Do you need to be reminded that he's the one who can come out alive no matter what he walks through and he can do the same for you? See, when faith is costly, we cling to Jesus because we know who he is. There's a second truth from this that we need to know. And that is that when faith is costly, we cling to Jesus also because we trust what he says. This reminds me of another story. Apparently talking about clinging to Jesus lends itself to illustrations that come out of adventure sports. But when I was when I was in high school, I had a friend whose family had a boat. And one of the things we would do when we'd go out on a boat is we would tube. Maybe you're familiar with this. You know, you've got this inflatable tube that is attached to the boat and and it becomes this motorsport version of a rodeo where the people in the boat do everything they can to try to buck the person off the tube. And so we would just hold on for dear life. The first time I did this, there was something very important that I didn't know. Okay, I'm holding on. I'm laying down on the tube. We're going there. They're turning, causing me to hit the waves. I'm bouncing all over the place. And then something happens and my weight shifts and the tube flips. And now instead of me riding the tube, the tube is riding me and I am underwater just being dragged along and I don't let go. I'm holding on. I want to be tough. And finally, the pressure just causes me to let go. And at that moment, I felt like the entire lake had been filtered through my sinuses. It's always a bad situation when you have to swim to your swim trunks, right? And so as as I I put myself back together and I climbed back into the boat, my buddy who was driving was like, dude, what is wrong with you? I was like, I was just trying to hold on. And he said, he goes, you just let go because when you're in a situation like that, it's never going to get better. Here's the thing I want you to know. Sometimes I tell you a story because Jesus is like that story. Sometimes I tell you a story because Jesus is not like that story. This is the latter. Jesus never tells you, just let go because it's not going to get better. When it feels like life flips over, when it feels like you are upside down and being dragged through something you don't want to be in, Jesus never says, just let go, because it's never going to get better. He says the exact opposite. He says, hold on, just cling to me, because I promise you that it will get better. And the reason we cling to Jesus, the reason we never let go of him, no matter what it costs us, is because we trust what he says. See, to the church in Sardis, he told them, he goes, you're going to suffer. You're going to die. But here's what you need to know. The second death, It will never harm you. What he's referring to is is what was called in other places in Scripture, the second death, referring to the moment when God judges those who are unfaithful to Jesus and, and, and destines them for eternal separation from him. That was called the second death. And he goes, here's the thing. You're afraid of dying, but the thing that will destroy you, being separated from me forever, you will never taste that. In the letter to the church in Philadelphia, He says, I need you to know this, that when you are faithful, when you are victorious, I will establish you like a pillar in my temple. See, when the whole city of Philadelphia had been leveled by an earthquake, there was only one thing that was standing, the pillars of the temple. They were the only thing in the whole city that was strong enough and secure enough to remain. And Jesus says, you know those pillars that can never be knocked down? You will be like that in my kingdom. You will be established firm and secure if you just cling to me. In my presence, in my house, for all of eternity, you will be with my God. You will have my name on you. He says, you will be with me. You will belong with me. Nothing can ever change that. What he's promising to these churches, what he's saying to you is this. If you cling to Jesus, even when it's costly, when it costs you opportunities, when it costs you relationships, when it costs you a reputation, when it hurts because of words or mistreatment or whatever else, he says, if you cling to me, there is a promise for you. Life everlasting. Like even if this world does to you the very worst this world could do, even if your faith costs you your life, there is a life beyond that that will be absolutely worth it if you just cling to me. See, here's what we know. We know that Jesus will return. And when he returns, 
we will stand before him and we will be judged based on how we loved Jesus and lived for him during this life. And sometimes living for him in this life is extremely costly and it hurts. I'm not talking about the pain associated with the general brokenness of this world. I'm talking about the pain associated with walking with Jesus. Sometimes it's costly. But Jesus says, if you cling to me because of who you know me to be and how you trust what I say, if you cling to me in that that act of faith, that's what faith is, knowing who Jesus is and trusting what he says. If you have faith, if you hold it up like a shield, it will not shelter you from financial loss or physical pain, but it will protect you from spiritual death now and forever. And you will be welcomed into my kingdom for all of eternity. And that will make it worth it no matter what it costs you. So church, I don't know what faith costs you, but I hope that there is absolutely no cost that could pry your fingers off of Jesus. Here's the questions I want you to reflect on today. If you could just take a few moments right after this service to ask these questions. First one is this. What does your faith in Jesus cost you? Name it. What does your faith in Jesus cost you? Where do you feel it? And the second question is this. How do you need to cling to Jesus by knowing him and trusting him more? How do you need to cling to Jesus by knowing him and trusting him more? I know that there are some with us today who have never taken a hold of faith, have never clinged to Jesus for the very first time. And so here is my challenge to you. If you do not have faith in Jesus yet, if you've never crossed that line and made a decision that you know who he is and you trust what he says, then today is your day to take that first step. And so I I want to invite you in just a moment to pray with me as a sign to you and God that you are serious about this and you want to hold on to him. And so church, if you've already done this, if you've already made a commitment to Jesus, then would you right in this moment just pray that someone would say yes to Jesus today for the very first time. Let's pray together. Father God, we worship you in a world that is lost and broken and lives that sometimes Uh, Faith costs us deeply. God, we cling to you because we know who you are and we trust what you say. And for those who, who are ready to place faith in Jesus for the very first time, repeat after me, God, I believe in you. Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sin and set me free from that. You alone are my Lord. And I live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made a commitment to Jesus today, we just ask you to text the word Jesus to the number on the screen so that our campus pastor can follow up with you and keep walking with you toward a life of faithfulness so you too will be ready when Jesus returns. Church, let us stand and sing one last song together as we worship the Jesus who is the first and the last, the one who died and is alive again, the one who holds the keys to his kingdom and he uses those keys to open the door and to welcome us home. Let us stand and worship him again.